um, and will be available on our website um, after uh, the live session this afternoon. And so I just wanted to, uh, as I already said, welcome you. This is a briefing on the 2021-22 um, um, uh, California current. Um, thanks to see your face. If I said, if you can, if you can mute yourself, please, when you're um, not trying to talk to us. Sorry. Okay. As I was saying, uh, this is a briefing on the 2021-22 California Current Ecosystem Status Report. It's being presented by the Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team leads. Those doctors. Chris Harvey and Toby Garfield, who are from the Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers, respectively. Um, as many of you probably know, this report is presented uh, every year to the council at the March meeting. And this briefing is an opportunity for advisory body members and members of the public to get a better understanding of the report's contact, uh, contents before the uh, uh, council meeting starts, uh, this uh, uh, report will be presented to the council during their session on Sunday, March 13th. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, turn the proceedings over to Chris and Toby for the presentation. And uh, so please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you very much, Kit, um, and thank you all who are joining today. Um, this is the first time we've done this on Ring Central, so there may be a few hiccups as we go along. Um, and as Kit said, in the past, we've given this presentation, uh, we've given previews of this pre presentations to committees and subcommittees before we give the presentation to the council uh, to allow them to um, come up with their comments for the council. Um, Kit asked us to do this one early, um, which we're happy to do, um, and have it open to all interested parties um, so that more time could be spent in the committees and subcommittees on discussion and, and um, other matters. So please consider this the off-off-Broadway uh, initial giving of this because it's um, 10 days until the big opening night for us. Um, so... Um, Certainly, the, this presentation will, will evolve as we digest um, and include your feedback and, and suggestions. So we thank you for that in advance. Um, we're going to request that we save comments until after the presentation. So if you could either um, write your questions in the chat or, or be ready um, at the end of this, it would be good simply to help us um, get our timing and everything together on this. So with that, um, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Toby Garfield from the Southwest. I'm joined by Chris Harvey from the Northwest. Um, I will give the initial part of um, this summary, the introduction and the environmental information, and then Chris will take over for the ecological and human dimension summaries. Uh, as you'll see, 2021 was a very interesting year with both recovery and some uh, strong signs of significant um, continued stress. Um, Chris, if we can go to the first uh, slide or next slide. So um, we're going to present the plus and the minus here in, in uh, summary in two infographics. Um, over the open ocean, the, there were very favorable phys physical conditions over the shelf and slope. Uh, we're experiencing La Nina conditions, and then we also have a very negative Pacific decadal, decadal oscillation. Um, both of these are generally indicative of, of um, good productivity in the um, California current. We've had above average upwelling, or 2021 was above average upwelling. Uh, some of the coolest stealth conditions since 2013, and a pretty expensive cool area. So we had a, a good habitat um, for uh, the biota that prefer the cooler area. Um, there was also a very strong upwelling, so that provided a good nutrient supply uh, at the base of the food web. Trying to figure out what are the resilience factors that means that bounce back really strong have. Young Zhou, if you could mute yourself, that would be very nice. 
Anyways, um, there are positive ecological systems. Thanks. Um, there are positive uh, ecological responses. The lipid-rich northern copepods were highly abundant off Oregon. And this created favorable conditions for the juvenile salmon entering the ocean off Washington and Oregon. Uh, further south, there was continued very high abundance of anchovies, um, both in the surveys and in predator diets. And there were positive trends in productivity and growth rates of the upper uh, predators, which we represent by birds and marine mammals. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> however, it wasn't so good for um, the terrestrial side. So um, we had early snowmelt, drought, warm streams, record heat, extreme, uh, and widespread wildfires. So this was obviously not good conditions for freshwater or the freshwater periods of anadromous species. Um, offshore, we had another um, marine heat wave. Um, it <clears throat> extended most of the year. Uh, and um, it was one of the, it's one of the top tens so for three years in a row. We've had large uh, heat waves in the summertime. Um, Part one result of having strong upwelling is that we bring low, low oxygen water up onto the shelf. And last year, um, there was widespread near bottom hypoxia off both Oregon and Washington uh, for May through October. And then finally, fishery landings continued to decline in 2021 for several of the target species, although revenue improved for many of these species. So with that, we'll start looking at the physical conditions. You can go ahead, please. So 2021 was a tale of three regimes. Offshore, we had the warm conditions in the North Pacific. They continued with the presence of a very large marine heat wave. The black circle in the lower left diagram there on that plot of area versus duration uh, is the where that where last year fell in terms of area and duration. Um, it was the sixth longest in time and the seventh largest in area. And it's the third year in a row since 2019 that has had a top 10 uh, marine heat wave, both in size and longevity uh, in the Eastern Pacific. On the other side on land, uh, the second year of severe drought continued to bake the West Coast with hot, dry weather. And unfortunately, these conditions allowed ignition of fires, which uh, wildfires, which spread rapidly over large areas. But in between those two were really good conditions for the um, near shore shelf slope uh, ocean. We had very strong upwelling, and that had very strong uh, supply of nutrients as well. Uh, a large expanse of habitat. Um, and so we had an area that was getting a good supply of nutrients as well as a pretty good uh, region for um, marine habitat. If we go ahead and look at some of the large scale details, um, the three basin scale or large scale indices that we always report on, the Ocean Nino Index uh, is a measure of the temperature at the Eastern Equatorial region. Um, a positive ONI is, La, is El Nino conditions, a negative ONI is La Nina. And during uh, uh, La Ninas, we generally favor higher productivity, cooler, drier conditions uh, in the Eastern Pacific. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is a measure of the temperature anomaly in the Eastern Pacific. Uh, a negative uh, PDO is indicative of cooler SST, and this also favors higher productivity uh, in the California <laughs> ecosystem. And then finally, the third um, plot there, time series, is the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation, uh, which is a measure of the circulation of the um, North Pacific Gyre. And a negative value is usually a slower circulation, a positive um, <clears throat> value is stronger circulation and the inclusion of more Alaska, um, Gulf of Alaska waters. So uh, the PDO, the NPGO had been very negative and in the last two years it has climbed back up into sort of neutral territories. So again, 
Um, the indication from the NPGO is that we're seeing a return to uh, stronger, uh, more favorable conditions in the California current. So taken, taken together, these three really do should be interpreted as a signal to higher productivity. Okay. Um, to finish off the large scale um, indicators, the uh, marine heat wave continued to be present. Um, as noted in 2021, uh, the major um, marine heat wave was the third largest in a row, or third large one in a row, and it was a very persistent. Um, it formed in the spring of the year and lasted a long time. Um, as the time series, <clears throat> these uh, four plots here show you sort of the time series of um, that marine heat wave. And one thing to notice is that a marine heat wave is not a large fixed blob, but a feature that can transform quickly over time. And that is in part because the surface of the Eastern Pacific has been warmer than average, and it only takes a relatively small increase in heat to exceed the marine heat wave threshold. What was really different about last year's marine heat wave was that it remained offshore most of the year. There was only a very short incursion in June along the West Coast, and then again in August along the Canadian coast. But for all intents, it did not significantly impact uh, the California current ecosystem. And that's illustrated in the um, diagram there on the lower right, where um, anything that's green means it had a less than 25% coverage within the EEC coverage, uh, I mean, the EEC area off California. So you can see in 2021 that really had very minimal impact. Moving on to some site-specific data. Um, from here on, where we're talking about site-specific uh, places, we'll try to include a, a diagram in the upper left of where the data that we're talking about are located. So um, upwelling in 2021 was very strong, and that also favors productivity. So um, these are for three latitudes, 33, 39, and 45, 45 degrees north. The left series of um, Time series are the upwelling of water, QD, the water, the water vertical flux of water. And you can see it was quite strong, strongest along 39 degrees um, north, and um, also some very high values, significantly above one standard deviation for short periods. The right hand column is the uh, estimate of nitrate flux. So it's the biologically effective upwelling or beauty. And again, you can see that at 39 degrees, uh, it was very strong. And there was that period um, after in, in, uh, in May um, where some of the largest values of nitrogen flux had been measured up into the water column. So not only do we have very, uh, some very strong peaks of both water transport and, and nitrate transport, um, but the other important thing is the sawtooth pattern because if you have a period of relaxation after the strong injection of water, then you have enough time for the nutrients to be taken up by primary productivity. And so this sawtooth pattern is, is really quite important for establishing um, a, a very productive uh, area for um, the California coast. And it, it occurred all the way along the coast. You'd have these upwelling and relaxation periods. So where am I? I guess next slide. So because of this upwelling, the cool water habitat was really expanded. And this is important for a lot of species, both uh, resident and HMS species, uh, migratory species. Um, and a way to try and describe the um, cold water extent is using the habitat compression index. So it's a measure of the balance of cool water, cool water and warm water. Um, from the coast out 150 kilometers. And an HBI, an index of one, means there's very little compression. In fact, the whole area is cold. A low uh, HCI value means that there's a large intrusion of warm water and the um, cool habitat uh, is compressed to the coast. So following a period of very low um, habitat compression index or very compressed area, cold water, it's been expanding um, with this um, strong upwelling. And so you can see that um, both the winter and um, spring HCI index uh, were approaching one for 2021. In other words, the strong upwelling provided a very large area of cool water. 
Um, this map on the left there is just giving you an idea of what it looks like, uh, how that expanse of, of cool water expands out, which in March of last year covered 97% of that area. Um, initially, the HDI was just computed for this area, 35 to 40, degree, 40 degrees north, which is the box that has the yellow shading in it on the left there. Um, and the council requested that we expanded that to um, calculate the HCI more areas. So it's it's now going to be calculated in um, all those four. Well, it is now calculated in those four areas that are sketched out on the map there, and they all appear in the report itself. Um, going on, if we could. So um, subsurface temperatures have also been showing a, a evolution from the very warm conditions we saw uh, in the 2013 um, El Nino and, and um, marine heat wave. Uh, the two plots on the left are um, individual stations off the coast. The top one is off the Newport line at uh, NH25, 25 nautical miles offshore. And the bottom or middle plot there is um, from the Cal Coffee line 90 off Dana Point at station 30. And what you're seeing is over the upper 250 meters in this, you're seeing that the really warm conditions that we saw in the early and middle parts of um, 2010s uh, have cooled off. And in 2020 and 21, we're, start, we're seeing more average subsurface temperatures um, in the water column. This uh, bottom plot on the lower right, um, I really like it because it's a it's an average of the from the coast to 200 kilometers offshore along the Trinidad headline, showing you the time series from 2015 up until present. Um, and what you see is that in the um, very large El Ninos we had in 2015 and 2019 you see that the warm water penetrates quite deep, 400 meters or deeper. Whereas if you look at the times when we had the significant marine heat waves, those are much more trapped to the surface. So that warming uh, is only in the upper 100 meters or so. It doesn't penetrate anywhere near as deep as we see during um, El Nino conditions. So what we're seeing now is, is cooler conditions. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so of course, it can't all be great. And when you have strong upwelling, uh, the water that you're drawing up onto the shelf and slope is coming from a region of the ocean that has very low dissolved oxygen. So what happens with strong upwelling is you, you bring that um, low oxygenated water up onto the shelf and slope, and generally uh, you can form hypoxic uh, conditions um, on the, on the um, benthic area. So this is diagrams taken from the um, uh, Northwest Juvenile Salmon and Ocean Ecosystem Survey cruises. Uh, it's June snapshots um, over 15 years of what the distribution of um, low oxygen waters was in the upper 200 meters. And so it gives you an idea of the variability. Um, last year, when we showed the um, JSCOPE um, model prediction for the low um, DO uh, up on the shelf here, it, predicted very similar to what we saw in, in June of 2021, which was um, low oxygen coming up on the shelf, starting with the Oregon coast and then mi migrating, running up towards the north. Um, so it seems to be the prediction was reasonably good and um, the low oxygen conditions were extensive uh, last summer up on the uh, Oregon Washington shelf. Um, I think I've got the J scope for, for this year next and uh, again, it's predicting conditions very similar uh, to what the prediction was for last year, which is hyboxic conditions um, beginning off of Oregon uh, on the Oregon shelf and slope in May and slowly spreading through the summer um, up to cover the whole uh, coastal region. Um, we're not showing it this year, but the ocean acidification um, <clears throat> uh, from aragonite so the a pattern very similar to this, that is um, corrosive waters, again, coming up on the shelf, starting to the south and over time um, spreading up and, and sh showing up uh, off the Washington coast as well. So the, there's, a, of course, this is a model prediction and there's a fairly high uncertainty for both the uh, hypoxia and the uh, aragonite saturation values. So if we shift now to terrestrial conditions, 
Um, I pulled up a plot here. I decided I'd put some daily uh, temperature anomalies um, for these um, five sites um, to, for two reasons. One, to show you that last year was really hot and it was hot all year long, but then also the two vertical arrows um, on each plot. Uh, the first one is uh, pointing to April conditions and the warm anomalies that showed up in April. And the second one is is uh, June, showing the the beginning of the summer long heating uh, that was really excessive. You can't read it on these plots, but the horizontal bars are five degree uh, centigrade in increments, just to give you an idea of just how warm uh, each of these these were. So um, this is just sort of setting the the uh, setting the stage to show that 2021 was extremely hot uh, on on the whole region. Um, and if we go to the next one, one result of that April heat is um, we've always reported the April one snow water equivalent as these are the water condition, water storage conditions for the summer. Um, and so on the left there is the April 1, 2021 um, plot that um, up until now we've always said, hey, this gives you a pretty good idea of the storage uh, available uh, in the area. And you can see that in California and Idaho, it was uh, in the 75% range, whereas in, in Oregon and Washington, it was above average for most of the snow water equivalent. So it looked like it was gonna be a pretty good year. But April was so hot, especially the first and third weeks of April, that on the 1st of May on the right, you can see what the snow water equivalent was. That California and Idaho were almost completely depleted and that Oregon and Washington uh, had very low values. Well, average, it's sort of mixed around average. But certainly, um, certainly, it shows that the snow reserves were nearly depleted by the 1st of May last year. So another uh, way to look at some of these conditions um, that are resulted from that are, um, if we can go to the next slide, please. These are three plots of water year precipitation anomaly, water year temperature anomaly, and water year vapor pressure de uh, deficit anomaly. Um, and the yellow boxes are the um, Southwest North American region where this came from. This came up uh, in a very recent paper by Williams et al. Um, <clears throat> and what it's showing you is that um, the top plot there showing the area and then the time series, the um, precipitation anomaly, uh, the black line is the annual va value for that particular, for within that box. And the red line is a 22 year running mean of what that value is. So you can see that the uh, precipitation anomaly is dropping. Uh, and if you take the 22 year mean, it's dropped about 10%. If you were to take a, a shorter time period, it would have dropped significantly more than that. Uh, similarly, the middle panel there, the temperature anomaly, you can see how that has been rising um, pretty steadily since uh, about 1970. Um, and again, if we took a shorter time period, it would be a lot more than one degree uh, rise that we'd be seeing an average. And finally, the vapor pressure deficiency, which is sort of, a, it's, it's kind of like uh, a measure of relative humidity. It's the ability of uh, water, of air to hold water. Um, but it also means that when you have a higher um, vapor pressure anomaly, um, plants have to rely more on water in the ground than they do on water in the air that they get through their leaves. So again, positive value on that is another indication of dryness um, and conditions that are not very favorable. So, you know, 2021 was dry, hot, and continued to dry throughout the Southwest US. Um, and just to try and drive this home a little bit more, uh, just make sure you get the point what's happening on the freshwater side for both uh, salmon and other freshwater species. Um, on the left there is Lake Mead on the Feather River, one of the largest reservoirs in California. 2016, uh, it was full. Um, and then in April of 21, uh, you saw that it was, it was uh, very depleted. And in fact, by the fall of 2021, there was almost nothing left in Lake Oroville. And it's pretty hard to remember there, that bottom picture was February of 2017 when they were worried that the dam might fail because the reservoir was so full. So we've gone from very full and uh, plentiful water in 2017 to um, extreme or exceptional drought uh, in California and northern regions. 
the middle plot here is giving you a indication of the percent of the Western US that uh, was classified as either extreme or exceptional drought. Um, the Western US is defined as west of the 103 degree um, longitude line, which is about where the bound, eastern boundary of Colorado, uh, Wyoming, and Montana lies. So this is a, a larger scale index, but what you see is that starting in, 20, in 2020 and extending into uh, 2022, um, over 60%, over 70% of the Western US is classified as extreme or in exceptional doubt, drought. And then I also included a photograph here of fires. Um, I haven't been able to find a good uh, image of the distribution of 2021 fires. If anybody has one, um, I'd love to get it, but I'll keep looking on that. But I just, just as a reminder that uh, uh, we had significant fires um, throughout the whole region. Um, there are some really big ones in Oregon after April. And, um, you know, of course, this causes uh, big problems with um, sediment load, uh, ash, and instability of slopes around rivers. So uh, adding to the stress in the freshwater system. Okay. All right. So what does that mean for some of the species? Well, um, the top two time series there, the Columbia uh, glaciated are showing the time series of one day maximum flow and the seven day minimum flow. And really what they're showing you that um, over this period, over this seven year, five year period, um, which remember started in 2017 when we had maximum um, uh, available um, water in the reservoirs, it's been generally decreasing. So the one day maximum, we're seeing a general decrease, uh, still within average range, but uh, it's decreasing. And the seven day minimum slow, flow is also decreasing. Again, still in, um, in the average or standard deviation range, but it's been decreasing over time. If we look at the individual ESU, so the two plots down um, on the bottom here, um, these bivariant plots of recent trends on the x-axis, recent average on the y-axis, uh, and these are separated out by salmon ESUs, and the colors are generally cool in the north, warm in the south. Um, really what, they, what these two diagrams show that for this five-year period, almost everywhere, um, flows have been decreasing. Um, some of them, um, the trend is negative almost everywhere except for couple along uh, the lower Columbia River there. But um, <clears throat> the trend in max flow and the trend in seven day minimum flow has been increasing over this five year period. And it's pretty much fluctuating on average in terms of, of the average there. Okay, so um, I am going to um, end up by giving you conditions as they are now. Um, the snowpack, this is a little bit on the precipitation and snowpack as of February 28th, the end of February. So on the left is a cumulative diagram of precipitation for uh, the Northern Sierra. It's an H station index. Um, and I ran this yesterday. So it's showing you the conditions up to yesterday in, the, in Northern California. The shaded blue is the average. Um, for uh, 1990 through 2020. Um, uh, I think that value is 51, I can't quite read it. I also plotted the uh, largest um, precipitation plot up there on the top in the red line and the lowest, the green one, which was 1923, 24. And then the light blue line that goes all the way through was last year. So you can see where the drought of last year was getting pretty close to the driest year. The heavier blue line is uh, precipitation this year, and you can see that there were two precipitation events, uh, one in October and one in December. Um, and then other than that, it's been pretty dry. So the October one was a series of atmospheric rivers that blew through the area that uh, dropped over 10 inches of rain. Um, and, and the good thing about that was that uh, that rainfall was before the ground froze, so it helped saturate the soil. So there's a, a lot more moisture uh, in the soil this year than there was last year. And then the second uh, interval there in December, there were a couple of series of storms that came through um, that dropped another significant amount, maybe more than, more than uh, the October one. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of that was stored as snowfall. Um, so that was starting to uh, build up the, the snow reservoirs. 
But unfortunately, since the 1st of January, there has been almost no precipitation. Um, if you look on the uh, center panel there, this just gives you sort of the precipitation by month, and you can really see the boom or bust. Um, whereas, you know, October was booming, December was booming, but November and January were busts. And, and as soon as I'm able to get the plot for February, I think that'll also be a bust. So where does that leave us in terms of snow water equivalent? Um, on the right is the diagram for February 28th. You can see in California and Idaho, it is generally uh, average or below average um, storage of snow right now. Um, and um, in Oregon and Washington, it sort of it fluctuates uh, around average, either a little bit positive or a little bit negative. So basically, um, for this time of the um, border year, we are a bit below average, and we are a bit below average in snow storage. And with that, I think I have set the stage for Chris. Thanks, Toby. I uh, hope everyone can, can. Toby, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to talk first about some of the ecological indicators that we shared in our report, and they generally connect to what Toby talked about with respect to a cool and productive California current. And the news for marine consumers in 2021 mostly appears to have been pretty good. Uh, and we'll start as we generally do with the zooplankton community. The longest uh, zooplankton time series in our report is from the Newport hydrographic line off of Oregon, and it focuses on two groups of copepods, uh, which are important prey for many of the small fish out there. And um, the species assemblage of northern copepods plot at the top is generally larger and higher in fat content, and thus provides more nutritional benefits than the assemblage of southern copepods. And these uh, groups of copepods have been collected roughly every two weeks off of Newport since 1996. Now, in the spring and summer of 2021, the energy-rich northern copepods were well above average, and they achieved some of the highest volumes of the entire time series. And as you can see in the upper plot, their numbers have been steadily increasing uh, since the exceptionally large and strong marine heat wave of 2014 to 2016. So this is improving and good news for uh, forage fish out there. By contrast, the warmer uh, water and more energy poor southern copepods in the lower plot were below average in the spring and summer of 2021. And that continued their downward trend over the past five years. So these indicators are definitely consistent with the cool, nutrient-rich, and productive system that Toby alluded to earlier. And they reflect good feeding conditions for small fishes off of Oregon in 2021. Another key zooplankton group uh, is the group of species of krill that occur throughout the California current. And uh, here the signals are a little bit more complex, perhaps just because we're expanding our spatial scale out quite a bit. Uh, but we track the size uh, of adults of one of the key krill species, Euphausia pacifica, off of Trinidad Head in Northern California, and that's the upper uh, right corner there. And uh, the size of Euphausia pacifica uh, was above average in 2021, which suggests that the individual uh, krill was providing good bang for the buck as a prey item in this area. And we also are showing a, a time series of biomass of krill on the same transect, uh, and it was around average in 2021, um, although down from the very high biomass it was observed in 2020. So generally speaking, good conditions for krill uh, off of Trinidad Head. And uh, there were also, just an anecdotally, we can add that there were large catches of krill reported from uh, the Newport uh, hydrographic line in 2021 as well. Uh, while uh, surveys further to the south from Monterey Bay and down uh, were um, more below average in terms of krill, perhaps not coincidentally, though, that area down south is also where anchovy biomass is very high. So there could be a grazing effect going on there, but we just really don't know. In any case, krill biomass did exhibit some regional variation in these 2021 surveys. And down at the bottom, some of the predators that we examined also suggest uh, valuable krill production in 2021. A more nearshore species of krill, that's uh, Thysanoessa spinifera, has increased dramatically in the diets of Cassin's auklets at southeast Farallon Island off of central California. And krill abundance was also greater in albacore diet observations in 21, uh, 2021 than it had been in recent years. 
So uh, generally, um, you know, a lot of predators making use of krill out there. We have several uh, different regional forage surveys uh, examining forage fish and other uh, components of the pelagic community. Because the surveys use different survey methods and because the species groups are really too diverse to show all the time series plots in one uh, slide, we summarize the forage community data with these cluster diagrams. Now they tell you which species tend to change in sync with one another. Those are the groups divided out by the horizontal black lines. They also tell you how relatively abundant different species are with redder uh, being uh, more abundant and bluer being more rare. And finally, they show you when there were years that had some big shift in the similar structure marked by the vertical black lines. So starting up in the north, the pelagic assemblage uh, sampled off of Washington and Oregon over the last several decades has these three clusters of fish, squid, and jellyfish groups. And it's had several large temporal shifts. Um, and this community is also certainly a, a dynamic one, as you can see from all the checkerboarding of red and blue throughout the plot. Uh, but it has not seen a particularly major swing in assemblage structure since 2018. It does look as if some of the warmer water species that make up the cluster at the bottom, for example, pompano or, or butterfish and market squid, did decline a little bit over the last couple of years, though, after having been pretty abundant since 2015. Moving to the central region in the Monterey Bay area, a, an entirely different survey uh, that focuses more on pelagic young of the year ground fish and other parts of the forage uh, assembly also uh, falls into three distinct clusters. And it too has not had a major shift since 2018. Uh, but here the change that began in 2018 and continues as of last year is um, in large part due to highly abundant adult anchovy. Uh, which was again the case in 2021. 20, uh, also since 2018, catches of young of the year rockfishes and other species in the bottom uh, of uh, cluster there have been lower than they were during the 2013 to 2017 block of time that was dominated by the marine heat wave known as the blob. Although catches of young of the year rockfish, young of the year hake and market squid um, were all at or slightly above the long-term average in 2021. So again, here, the big story is lots of anchovy and uh, some bump up in some of the other uh, forage groups. Finally, the anchovy story continues further south in the forage assemblage that's uh, sampled off of Southern California. This uh, survey is focused on larval fish that were born in the spring of 2021. And again, we have three clusters of species groups once again, there have not been any recent swings uh, in assemblage structure, although we do have that data gap in 2020 due to COVID. The clear story here, again, is the abundance of that middle cluster of the featuring larval anchovy, uh, which had the highest catches of this entire time series in 2021. Uh, the species groups in the other two clusters were generally uh, average to below average last year with the exception up there in the upper right corner of a species mix of larval rockfishes, and they saw the highest catches observed since about 2012. So overall, the regional uh, pelagic forage uh, community uh, has not uh, seen any major swings in, in regional assemblages for some time. And in the central and southern portions of the California current, anchovy remain extremely abundant. And that storyline is backed up by data from a 2021 spring coastal pelagic species survey, which uses uh, acoustics, uh, trawls, and egg sampling to estimate the distribution, abundance, uh, species composition, and reproduction of multiple uh, CPS. The spring 2021 uh, survey spanned from the US-Mexico border up to San Francisco Bay, and indeed the vast majority of fish captured in the trawls uh, samples on this cruise were anchovy as were most of the floating eggs that they observed. And then based on the acoustics data that they also collected on this cruise, they estimate that this anchovy stock has increased by nearly 70% since their previous survey in 2019, and that most of that increase is due to age one and age two fish uh, born in 2019 and 2020 respectively, or you know, conversely. So it does look like anchovy will continue to be around this area for a while, and the previous slide of uh, larval fish data off of Southern California suggests that another strong year class may be on the way. 
We're also beginning to bring HMS diet data into our annual reports. And while we won't get into that in this presentation, several key HMS uh, that have been sampled do seem to be taking advantage of this anchovy boom. Other top predators also seem to fare well in 2021. Seabirds at colonies off of Central California, which are shown here, and Central Oregon had average to above average fledgling success, which suggests that there was good availability of high quality prey for them to bring back to their chicks. This includes both piscivorous birds as well as Cassin's auklets, whom we met a couple slides ago and feed primarily on krill. And uh, the piscivorous birds uh, shown here from Southeast Farallon Island in Central California, uh, and, and also birds uh, ex examined at nearby Año Nuevo Island fed primarily on anchovy in 2021. It's also noteworthy that citizen science programs did not observe any unusual mortality events of seabirds washing up dead on beaches in 2021, which is further suggestion that uh, overall feeding conditions in the system last year were pretty good. Similarly, California sea lion pups at the San Miguel Island colony indicate good feeding conditions for adult female sea lions foraging off of central uh, to southern California throughout 2021 and into early 2022. Sea lion pups born uh, in June from 2021 were above average in count for the fifth straight year. And this is brand new data in the lower uh, right corner, uh, updated just after the briefing book deadline, showing the uh, overwinter growth rate of sea lion pups at San Miguel. And the values were here were slightly above average, uh, and that continues a recent uh, pattern as well. This is all consistent with an abundant prey base uh, of good quality food, uh, most likely anchovy, but um, some other things in the mix as well. So let's finish the ecology section with some focus on salmon. And this is an updated and more extended version of the stoplight table developed by NIMPS and by Oregon State for summarizing early marine survival conditions for Chinook and coho salmon in the Columbia, uh, originating in the Columbia Basin and in coastal streams of the Northern California Current. The time series for uh, this stoplight table goes back to 1998, but here we just show you the most recent 10 years through 2021. Green cells tell you that an indicator value in that year ranked in the top third of all annual data in the time series. Uh, a red cell tells you that it ranked in the bottom third and yellow is in the middle. And as you can see, conditions for salmon in this region that went to sea in 2021 were really quite good. There's an awful lot of green there. And a lot of these indicators are ones that we've already talked about, like the favorable climate and ocean conditions that Toby talked about, the copepods that I mentioned earlier, and so on. And overall, the 2021 smolt year conditions were among the very best that this group of researchers has ever observed. We can use these uh, smolt year indicator suites as ecosystem-based outlooks of how salmon ocean survival might have been and how that might be reflected in returns for the year ahead. Uh, coho salmon that are going to be returning to this region in 2022 will mainly be made up of fish that went uh, to sea in 2021, uh, which as we just saw was a very favorable year. So that certainly is encouraging for coho salmon. Chinook salmon that are returning to the Columbia Basin in 2022 will mainly be made up of fish that went to sea in 2020. And you can see that that column of indicators is more mixed uh, with some red, some yellow, and some green. As the transition to the conditions that we've been seeing uh, that are so encouraging over the past few years was really only just getting started in the winter and spring of 2020. So something of a mixed bag for um, Chinook. We might expect that their um, survival uh, for fish returning to the Columbia Basin in 2022 is going to be closer to recent averages. And we have some updated quantitative modeling in the appendix to our report that gets into further detail on that. A simpler stoplight table has been developed for natural area Central Valley Fall Chinook salmon. Uh, and this one brings in several indicators of freshwater conditions. And you'll recall from Toby that freshwater indicators have been moving in a fairly unfavorable direction in recent years. The dominant year class of Central Valley Fall Chinook that will return in 2022 were from brood year 2019, and that's indicated by the heavy black line. And their indicators are mixed, as were those from fish the prior brood year that will return this year as H4s. You can see the mix of green, yellow, and red in those rows. 
And indicators for both JAX and H5 fish uh, were pretty unfavorable. As we note uh, here, uh, we know here that unlike the salmon from the Northern California current that were described in the previous slide, these fish are entering an ocean environment that is full of anchovies. And uh, heavy predation on anchovies can introduce thiamine deficiency in salmon that can then get passed to the eggs and fry. So while hatchery fish can be treated for thiamine deficiency, the natural area fish can't be efficiently treated. And we don't yet know the extent to which this is going to be a problem for natural area stock productivity. But given all the anchovy out there and the um, a number of other predators that are feeding on them, it, it does bear some mention. As you all know, the Habitat Committee, the salmon technical team and IEA scientists, if you could mute your phone if they're not muted already, please. Thanks. Uh, so uh, uh, ABs and the IEA scientists have developed some more extensive uh, stoplight tables for Sacramento River and Klamath River Fall Chinook, following the rebuilding plans for those stocks that were centered around brood years in the mid 2010s. And uh, these tables that are shown here include uh, freshwater, marine, and hatchery indicators, and thus relate uh, to more of the full life history and complexity of these stocks. This is still fairly preliminary uh, work, and I know those stoplight tables on the left are pretty difficult to look at, uh, kind of look like a veggie medley, but um, a very simple summary of them is provided in the time series plots in the middle. So what we've done here is simply to take the combined annual standardized averages of all those freshwater indicators um, from those tables and all the marine indicators from the tables and plot them separately through time by brood year. You can see that they are quite variable for both stocks uh, and that the two stocks are experiencing different conditions from one another. And you can also see that sometimes the freshwater and marine averages are moving in the same direction at the same time, while other times they're more out of phase. In the year since the rebuilding plan began, which is brood year 2012, which is signified by the red vertical line, the marine and freshwater averages are out of phase for both stocks. Um, some of the patterns, uh, some other patterns that emerged too are that marine indicators were quite poor for brood year 2018, but have improved since then. And brood, brood year 2018, I'm told, is going to make up a lot of the fish re returning to the Klamath River in 2022, so that's a concerning outlook. Also, you can see that brood year 2020, uh, which is fish that went to sea in 2021, had relatively poor freshwater indicators, and brood year 2021 could be in the same boat as well after the warm streams and low flows of last year. So that's going to wrap up uh, what we have now for ecological indicators. Uh, we're going to transition to some indicators of human activities and well-being, and we'll start with some hot off-the-presses updates of fishery landings and revenues. Uh, thanks to some late arriving data, we can uh, report that the drop in landings from 2020 to 2021 was actually less than 1%, which is better than what we thought uh, at the briefing book deadline. And a lot of this late arriving data was for Washington salmon and pushed overall coastwide salmon landings into positive territory into in 2021 relative to 2020. Same was true for shrimp, squid, and non-whiting groundfish. Uh, that said, several fisheries did experience uh, declines in 2021 compared to 2020, and total landings and uh, as well as landings for whiting and crab have been trending down for the last five years. And many of these time series are near low points uh, relative to uh, landings in recent decades. The revenue picture in 2021 was rosier for most management groups, and the also updated revenue uh, data relative to the briefing book um, indicates that total commercial landings revenue was up 13% in 2021 20, uh, compared to 2020, and it was just below the average of the past uh, 30 years of revenues. And nearly all management groups saw revenue increases in 2021 over 2020. Um, so we would uh, imagine that this has something to do with, uh, with increases in price per pound for a lot of the stocks. Uh, so that helped buffer some of the declines in, in landings. We also continue to track indicators that delve further into how fishers acquire their revenue and how revenue is concentrated geographically within and across fisheries. Our hope is that these indicators will give us some sense of the adaptive capacity and resilience of vessels and ports with different types of fishing portfolios 
and how well fisheries are prepared for and able to respond to variation coming from the environment, markets, uh, regulations, and so forth. On the left here is a, a time series of revenue diversification, which generally estimates how uh, many species groups the average vessel is deriving its revenue from and how evenly that revenue is distributed among those groups that it's fishing. And as we've documented in, recent, in previous reports, uh, diversification of West Coast fishing revenues has declined over the past few decades, meaning that vessels are relying on smaller numbers of target groups on average to provide their revenue. And we saw the diversification in all three coastal states took a, a, another little dip in 2020, the most recent year for which data are available. Although uh, that dip was not unlike other variability that we've seen in this time series. On the right is an index of revenue concentration uh, developed with an uh, indicator that uh, is called the tile index, uh, which indicates uh, or it estimates how evenly revenue is distributed across uh, different IOPAC port groups. So this is geographic concentration of revenue. A higher value of this index means that revenue is highly more highly concentrated in a smaller number of ports. So here, for example, the CPS and HMS fisheries have the highest index values and overall are the fisheries that tend to land more of their revenue in a smaller number of ports. There is a lot to take in here uh, with uh, all these uh, squiggly blue lines. Uh, in, uh, for example, some fisheries like HMS and groundfish are showing some increasing concentration of revenue over time and others are showing more short or medium term fluctuations. But for now, I want to just point out one thing that all fisheries showed slight increases in revenue concentration in 2020. Although like the diversification change, uh, these increases were generally within the scope of variability that was seen previously. So if we might have expected that the COVID pandemic would have had a major effect in either index in 2020, it's not yet apparent in these data. Uh, that said, we do have a lot more work to do in that regard because these data are pretty highly aggregated and finer scale data discussions with participants and other um, investigative work might reveal uh, other outcomes. Another way that we're looking at patterns of fishing activity and revenue in different port groups is with fishery participation networks, which we introduced to the report just last year. These diagrams represent the amount of revenue coming into different fisheries and also illustrate the degree to which some vessels participate in multiple fisheries. And by participating in multi -fish multiple fisheries, they connect fisheries together in ways that could reflect a fishery or a port group's ability to adapt to changes. These networks are all from different years revenue data in Coos Bay, and they provide visual representations of different features of this particular port group from year to year, and we have them for many other port groups as well. For example, we can see changes in the size of nodes in different years reflecting changes in revenue. We can see changes in the number of connecting lines, which are also called edges, uh, that reflect different degrees of ves vessel participation in uh, two, the two linked fisheries. We can see that some staple fisheries for Coos Bay are commonly showing up as high revenue and well connected, such as crab, shrimp, salmon, and tuna. We also can see evolution in the network as when the uh, squid fishing became an opportunity in the later 2010s, at first as a fairly disconnected fishery, but by 2020 and 2021, a more well connected fishery. And we could also draw descriptive statistics from these networks to explore uh, over time or before and after ecosystem changes how uh, uh, the network might have responded. So for example, a metric, the, the metric that describes edge density uh, with the uh, overall connectedness of the number of lines in, this, in the network uh, could have to do with uh, greater flexibility as, as the, those numbers of connections increases. Um, so that's giving people more opportunity to move among fisheries and could be an indicator of resilience for the port group as a whole. Other descriptive network metrics can tell about how strongly connected individual fisheries are to the rest of the network. And we might expect that some of the strongest nodes uh, are overall are ones that convey overall connectivity, resilience, and identity within a port. They might also signal fisheries that are most likely to lead to spillover into other fisheries or into other activities if those strong, well-connected nodes are affected by an environmental change, a market change, or a regulatory change. 
We're going to close the human activities and human well-being section with an issue that we know is of interest to the council and to participant groups, and that is the potential for overlaps and trade-offs between fisheries and uh, offshore wind energy projects. In the past, we presented indicators of total contact uh, between federally managed groundfish bottom trawl gear and the seafloor. In this year's report, we take those same analyses and change the context uh, to compare trawling activity to prospective wind energy areas. And now that BOEM has released the call areas for projects off of Oregon, we can update the analyses that were in the briefing book to include all the call areas now off of California and Oregon. And we'll look at three separate indicators of groundfish trawling activity from the time series of logbook data that spans 2002 to 2019. These should give us some different ideas of um, the kinds of activities that have happened in the past that are happening now and uh, opportunities that could uh, uh, be subject to trade-offs in the future. And uh, hope, hopefully will help us guide conversations with uh, the council and the types of data that you'd like to see from different gears and fisheries. We start here with maps of the total distance trawled by uh, the vessels in this fleet in 2019 in and around each of the call areas, which are signified by the heavy black lines in each panel. This is just for non-confidential data. The warmer colors indicate more cumulative distance trawled. And in these first panels, the greatest activity in Oregon in 2019 is in a band that runs north to south through each of the call areas, while the greatest activity in 2019 in the Humboldt area is immediately shoreward of the call area between the call area and the hookup point to the, to the power grid uh, indicated by that black dot. On uh, the other hand, Morro Bay area had comparably little uh, trawl activity reported in, in 2019. The next set of indicators is the trends in total distance trawled over the past five years of available data with red uh, colors indicating where activity is increasing significantly, uh, neutral colors where activity the activity trend is steady and uh, ranging down to dark blue where activity is declining. Oregon's three call areas show considerable spatial variability uh, in these trends, both in and around the call areas. While the Humboldt call area has a band of strongly increasing activity right through the heart of the cell uh, uh, of the call area, and then several north-south bands of increasing activity shoreward of the call area, Morro Bay did not have enough non-confidential uh, data to estimate any trends. Finally, we show the proportion of total years in which a cell was trawled over the full time series to give somewhat more historic context for the bottom trawling activities and opportunities in different cells. Warmer colors mean a larger proportion of years with bottom trawling activity. And obviously, there's a lot of red and orange in and around the Oregon and Humboldt call areas. Uh, so uh, it's our hope that uh, further development of indicators like these will be useful in exploring potential trade-offs around wind energy development, and uh, that these are we consider these critical conversations for this report because they relate to the human dimensions uh, of the California current ecosystem. So let's uh, move on to our conclusions. Uh, in summary, the 2021 was, as Toby mentioned, a tale of three ecosystems. Uh, shown here on, uh, on our infographic, uh, you had a top 10 marine heat wave offshore, you had record heat, warm rivers, drought, and fires on land, and sandwiched right in between them is a record upwelling uh, year with cool, productive habitat uh, that supported a lot of good feeding conditions in much of the California current. These conditions extend many observations from 2020 as well, uh, and seasonal forecast models suggest that 2022 could bring uh, some similar uh, conditions given predictions about continuing La Nina conditions in the ocean and expectations of continuing drought in many parts of the West. And then finally, despite uh, some drops in fishery uh, landings in multiple target groups, we did see some rebounds in commercial fishing revenues following the very difficult fishing year of 2020. Given the rare combinations of extremes that we've seen in these last few years and with the struggles uh, around data collection in 2020, it is challenging to understand what is driving species production and distribution as well as fishery dynamics right now and to anticipate how they will respond uh, to these conditions in the years ahead. This is a diverse ecosystem full of very different types of species that respond to change at their own pace and it continues to be hit by these natural experiments. So it may take us several years to sort out what is happening right now. 
And climate change is likely to intensify this challenge as we get pushed into these new combinations of conditions more often and as extreme events become more and more extreme and more frequent. It's in that spirit that we included a short climate change appendix as a conversation starter in our report, or perhaps more fittingly, a conversation extension, because this idea actually came from the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel's recommendation following our report last March. Climate scientists, oceanographers, and ecologists are making advances in their ability to uh, explain previous conditions, to track current conditions, and to predict future conditions. And this arc of progress may provide some guidance for us to put more of our indicators and our overall reporting into the context of climate change, uh, hopefully in ways that support the activities of the Council, the fishery participants, NIMPS, and partners. And a potential first step for this is to work through together to articulate our needs, uh, priorities, and capabilities. Uh, what the council needs, what scientists are capable of providing to, to, to match that. And to co-develop an approach uh, to identifying and presenting climate uh, relevant indicators. Our appendix in includes this uh, essentially hypothetical table of indicator categories spanning from ones that are very well sampled and have skilled models that can provide forecasts or projections with measures of confidence around them to other uh, uh, indicators that are much less well sampled and for which prediction skill will likely be weaker and more uncertain at one or more time scales into the future. A table like this one could provide an essential uh, framework or step toward matching the council needs to research capabilities and would definitely help guide the CCIA team to develop indicators accordingly. We also provided some mock-ups of the kinds of presentation and vocabulary that could go along with climate-ready indicators, complete with well-intentioned but admittedly amateur graphic design by yours truly. At the heart of those mock-ups is a feeling that these analyses are very important to West Coast fisheries, and we want to present them with messaging that is accessible to anybody. Lastly, we are using the term co-develop around this appendix repeatedly and intentionally as we would want any such products to be useful. And our audiences will be better at saying what is and isn't useful than we will be. And we definitely look forward to additional discussions around whether this would be of interest uh, to the council, how to align it to council needs, and if it could be co-developed with the council family input um, so that its usefulness is maximized. We also look forward to seeing how we can adapt our reporting, planning, and capabilities uh, to support whatever FEP initiatives the Council chooses to take up next. That concludes our presentation, and Toby and I thank you for your time and your attention, and we look forward to discussion and questions. I guess if anyone does have a question, uh, we can try to keep track of the chat or the raised hand feature. Um, Toby, I hope you can come off mute and maybe Kit, you can come off mute too to help us uh, keep track of what's happening. But uh, if you do have questions or comments uh, or any kind of feedback, we welcome it. And I think, uh, Kit, if I'm not mistaken, we have about an hour remaining on the agenda for um, any kind of comment. And I guess we would also remind you that that uh, this is uh, still being recorded. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Chris, uh, let's see. Um, and I do see uh, Louis Simmons raised his hand. Well, thank you very much for that. It's a, pretty much encouraging on the most part. Uh, being in San Diego, very interested in whether the Cal Coffee uh, and the Sardine Survey were able to access Mexican waters this year. I know we were planning to, but I have not yet heard a report on whether we successfully got down into Mexican waters. Toby, would you happen to know the answer to that? You're on mute still. Uh, Louis, I should know the answer to that. I know that there was a last-minute 
will we be able to go? Will we not? And I can't remember. I think they did get down in there. <laughs> but I'll have to double check with somebody who was on the cruise. Oh, super. Well, thank you. We look forward to that. I did see them do the uh, final Southern line uh, into San Diego, and, and then I lost track of them. Thanks. Okay. Uh, question that's in the uh, that's in the the first question that came up in the chat, if that's okay, from um, from Arlene uh, Marins. I hope I'm pronouncing your last name right, uh, Arlene. I apologize if not. Um, the wildfires of 2020 and 2021 impacted water quality in many northwest streams with an influx of excess nutrients from burned vegetation increased turbidity, sedimentation, and fire retardants. Did or could the assessment of water quality in freshwater streams characterize or quantify the effects of wildfires on water quality? Would it be helpful to include a separate water quality indicator in the IEA report? Uh, I can only say, Arlene, that, uh, you know, that that, that is uh, certainly worthy of consideration uh, and especially given um, the uh, frequent episodes of, of widespread wildfires that we've seen, uh, the spatial variability in them uh, in, in recent years, and the expectation that we might see more of them. Uh, and I think we probably have uh, the know-how to, uh, to uh, with uh, colleagues in EPA as well as in NIMS uh, to get at what uh, some of the potential relationships between those kinds of materials are with salmon, but, uh, but I would definitely have to follow up with them on that. Uh, Toby, would you want to comment as well? No, I don't feel qualified to comment on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I definitely am not qualified to comment on the the scientific aspects of it, but certainly am qualified to say that we can we can definitely talk with uh, colleagues to see how how long it would take to get a representative time series of those kinds of indicators um, developed um, and how up to date it is and how uh, how well it could be represented in the report. Um, Kit, I think you saw another hand up. Is that right? Yeah, Corey Niles has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and thanks, Toby. Um, great presentation as always, Chris. I'm gonna. My question is about what you let you what you ended up with there, or you ended up with about um, some some more work with with you all on indicators and climate change in particular. And so, um, yeah, we are the ecosystem working group, and others are, are thinking about that for this upcoming meeting. What what could we do next? I guess what what comes to mind for me is that initiative number two was exactly sounds exactly. We tried to do exactly what you you're kind of proposing now um, again, or if I'm if I'm hearing what you're what you were suggesting was possible. So not that I expect you to remember initiative two, but that's where we we tried to. Um, find ways to apply this information that you present um, more directly in, into council's management decisions, and and you said it even better in, in your wrap up there. But so yeah, I don't know. Do you have any comments? What's changed? Um, we we kind of I guess my takeaway, which was it's not going to be as thorough as we can go back and read, but as you know, we just got to keep having this back and forth dialogue with you all coming to the council and. In us asking you questions about what what's what's facing us, um, and and you and vice versa. But yeah, any reactions to that? Like what we we tried something like that with a formal initiative. Um, what are you seeing we can do differently this time? Well, um, I would say what's changed. Uh, if I'm hearing well, first, thanks for your question, Corey. If I'm hearing your question right. Um, what's changed? Um, I think, you know, the, between the fact that the agency has certainly, you know, very explicitly targeted, uh, climate variability and change, uh, through its climate science strategy, as well as the, uh, plans for a climate fisheries initiative, um, the, um, the encouragement that I heard in the EAS's comment last year after our presentation and in some of the uh, discussion that followed it. Uh, and then just simply the, the ever-emerging sense that climate is having 
important impacts on our stocks and our fisheries right now, not 10 years into the future, not 20 years into the future. Uh, and, you know, some of the feedback that I believe came out of the um, climate fisheries or climate and communities initiative as well, where uh, we heard you know, again a lot of concern about um, what's going to happen next year and the year after uh, as being just as relevant as what's going to happen two or three decades from now. Um, so I think it all just helps us uh, feel like we're pointed in a common direction um, and that a framework like the one that I put into um, our table that I can't say I came up with, that came from uh, other people at uh, NIMF's uh, labs on the West Coast who are talking about the ability of different tools to provide forecast uh, skill and uh, certainty. Um, I think we're all just really uh, focused in the same direction and we, you know, recognize that it's a need that needs to be addressed, uh, you know, all, you know, yesterday. Um, I hope that answers your question and let me let Toby have a chance to weigh in too because uh, he's definitely got plenty of investment in this uh, effort as well. Toby, you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I was getting feedback. I turned it off. Um, I think you did a, a good job explaining our interest in going forward with this. So I, I don't think I can. Uh, I don't think I can add much to it. Um, but um, uh, Deb Wilson Vandenberg, I was just trying to um, answer your question. Um, the water managers have used the April one storage as a good indication of what's going to be available and 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 their predictions. So that's why we were using April first. Um, there haven't been too many years that have had a warm April like this, so it's something I think they'll have to be reconsidering. But um, we drew that date from from what we got from other people. So there was an earlier, more general question in the chat from Yvonne, uh, just if you had any um, anything particular, any particular feedback you're looking for from advisory bodies. And uh, in addition to reviewing Appendix E, also note that uh, Doug Fricke had his hand up. So if you have a response to Yvonne's question, and then we can uh, call on Doug for his question. Toby, would you like to respond to Yvonne first? Uh, if, thank you, Yvonne. Um, <clears throat> you know, really, our goal is to make this presentation and to tune the, the report to be most useful for the council to really start including climate information in, in a standard manner with their work. So um, the feedback we are looking for is this useful and how do we see going forward that this gets included in, in council deliberations? I would I would second that. I am also, I, th I think I'm as interested as ever, <laughs> we're always interested in whatever feedback we can get. And if there are times on advisory body calendars when they would like to sit down with us, whether it's at this meeting or a, or a future one. I'm also I'm I'm on pins and needles to see what people's comments uh, and uh, statements are with respect to the um, proposed um, FEP initiatives because almost regardless of which one gets chosen or which ones get packaged into one, however it works out, um, our report is going to be um, you know part of that going forward. I would imagine and um, and and we will want to you know, be interacting with all of you to make sure that our end of the bargain is held up uh, and uh, whatever role we have to play in those initiatives, uh, we understand it clearly from what your perspective is and your expectations. Uh, and, and we can talk about those, uh, you know, again, in, in the spirit of co-development. And uh, Doug Fricky, would you like to uh, come off mute and ask your question? Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm on the HMS advisory sub panel for primarily a northern at large representative. I heard more than once that you talked about the offshore hotspot that uh, you know both you gentlemen have uh, have uh, you know emphasized, but uh, 
noted. And also I noted that uh, you got some of your information uh, on what's out there from the, uh, the tuna sampling program that's currently going on. Uh, our, one of our industry organizations has a, a, a partner organization, American Fisheries Research uh, Foundation that we, uh, we support. And uh, I get the general impression, particularly offshore Washington and Oregon, this is probably one of your main or possibly your only source of uh, what's uh, going on there as far as feed conditions and whatnot. Is, is that uh, uh, going too far out to uh, extend what you, you gentlemen are, are presenting or is that a correct uh, assessment? Uh, Doug, thanks for the question. I'm afraid I don't know the particulars, but I do know from talking with the HMS scientists that provided the diet data that they were all, uh, the, the albacore data anyway, and I think probably others too, other HMS too, um, that's all based on samples provided by uh, commercial and recreational fishing, not by scientific survey. So the partnership uh, there between industry uh, rec sector and uh, science is uh, it's th there's no replacement for it. So yes, I think uh, I think this it, it, at the very minimum the spirit of of your, your question the answer to the spirit of that question is yes. Uh, yeah. uh, thanks thanks on that. I just put a little plug in for what we're trying to do. Uh, we've been doing this sampling sort of on and off. Uh, uh, we're trying to work with uh, your NIMS. Uh, folks down Southwest Center to see if we can't get a grant to do this on a regular annual basis. So we see the trends up and down. So any good word that you could put in for us, uh, we'd appreciate. Yeah, I know uh, I know the folks in the Southwest uh, value what they're getting from you and I know they want to see that uh, expand a bit. Thank you. Yeah, and the and the fish, the the predators see things that the nets often don't. So uh, it's definitely um, extremely mutually informative. Yeah, thanks, Doug. So there's another uh, question in the chat from J Jenny Waddell um, asking if you're already connected with Bone, that's the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on your results regarding fishing in and adjacent to wind energy call areas. Um, just noting that uh, those trawling history analyses may be useful for maritime heritage and or paleo shoreline considerations. Uh, so the two fishery centers and the, and the regional office have formed um, a wind energy group uh, and they will be interacting with Bone. Um, they're they're really just getting organized and getting started, but I I know the intent is there to to uh, work closely with Bone on this. And I can add uh, so thanks for the question, Jenny. Um, uh, Kelly Andrews at the Northwest Fishery Science Center is the lead analyst on uh, the. Um, analyses that generated those maps. Uh, Kelly is part of that uh, consortium that Toby just referenced, uh, and so we'll be uh, in increasing conversations with uh, with the Boehm folks as uh, Noah and Boehm, uh, you know, continue to gather around the same table. And I also see in your question um, some other uh, uh, ideas uh, about uh, marine resources that are more relevant to sanctuaries. And uh, I think pretty, I feel pretty sure that Kelly has looked into some of those uh, potential uh, benefits of our, or some potential outcomes of those analyses as well. And he very definitely could give you some, um, some uh, more input on that. And I know you know Kelly well and uh, know how to contact him. And uh, I saw Donna's name, Donna Schrader's name just pop up in the chat. So I should definitely make sure to get that input to uh, Yes, NOAA is also a member of the Ocean Renewable Energy Task Force, which will provide feedback on the call areas. Yes, thanks, uh, Donna. Um, 
so Corey has another question. Yes, no one else is going to ask anything, but yeah, thanks for your time. Um, Toby, I think I asked this one to you regularly um, about Northern Washington or just what North, uh, the Pacific Northwest and, and the upwelling indices in, 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 your, in, in the, the rhyming indices um, that I know that you didn't name. But uh, so I, I, wondering the, um, and you, you've told me the answer before, us the answer before, but you know, the, my, the general understanding that I'm, I may be off on is that the Northwest sees, can seize a lots of nutrient input, even when, when upwelling is not very, you know, not as strong as is off central California, for instance. So does that, do those oh. indices about the, the nitrogen transport, do those cover that kind of influx from the Strait and Columbia River, or is it just based on the um, strength of the, the upwelling? It, it's definitely based on the strength of the upwelling. That indice comes from um, looking at the ROMS model, calculating the vertical flux of water um, in the ROMS model, and then using a temperature nitrate relationship to come up with an estimate of what the uh, nitrate values are that are being supplied. So it is, it is not including input from the rivers um, or the Strait of Juan de Fuca. Um, so, um, no, they are not included. That does that answer everything there, Corey? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. I'll and maybe we'll follow up with you sometime on more. But no. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate it. And and if you look closely at that, um, the upwelling, the water one cutie, and the nitrate one beauty, um, you'll see that there's um, negative values of the upwelling. So when you have a negative value of the upwelling, it doesn't mean you have negative nutrients. Uh, you just kind of ignore that part of it. Uh, but that's if it's negative, it's saying there's downwelling, which which would be to some extent some removal, but you don't know how much and you don't know what's replacing it. So um, it's a little hard to interpret it when when the uh, water flux value is less than zero. So looking at the chat, uh, just one last note on uh, wind energy is uh, Susan Chambers notes that the Council's Marine Planning Committee will also be talking about the Oregon call areas um, on Friday, March 4th from 1 to 5 uh, p.m. And uh, I believe that uh, there's the link there and uh, certainly can be found in the on the Council website as well. And uh, we are looking forward to listening on that, too. Um, so uh, I also see there's a question from Michelle Robinson. Uh, it says, thank you, Toby and Chris, for an informative and digestible report and presentation. Glad to hear um, all those things. Uh, do you know what the readiness is for using ecological information to inform ground fish stock assessments? Um, so thanks for that question. Um, it's always good to, um, you know, we we kind of skipped over ground fish in this presentation. Um, and so it's good to be called uh, to account on uh, another FMP that we kind of left out. Well, ma the main reason I would say that we left them out is because there was no ground fish bottom trawl survey in 2020. And the 2021 data are still in the process of being uh, worked up. And so we didn't really have uh, as much uh, really to, to update as um, in this on these indicators um, as as we might have. But to your question, uh, Michelle, I think uh, having, having talked with um, some of the assessment biologists um, uh, that um, uh, that we're colleagues with, that there are several ground fish stocks for which the prospects of providing um, ecological information to support uh, assessments and TAC setting and so forth could be pretty good. Um, the ones that come to mind for sure uh, that already have good published science on them um, are sablefish, petroli sole, and Pacific whiting or Pacific hake. Uh, and those are um, groups for which there's been a fair amount of work done on using uh, oceanographic models and related conditions to get some insight into the variability around recruitment. Um, and those are to my eye anyway um when you know when i was in graduate school everyone said the recruitment variability is this you know unattainable brass ring um and and if you can if you can conquer that one then you know they'll give you the keys to the city well we're, we're we have really 
incredibly smart colleagues that are answering those questions with, with pretty good um, explanatory power, not yet to the point that they're actually in assessments, but certainly to the point that they're similar to the kinds of indicators that are being used in uh, ecosystem considerations, discussions, and risk assessment um, for TAC setting that is being modeled by the North Pacific Council and the Alaska Center, um, where uh, if nothing else, the ecosystem information can be used to, to see if it agrees with assessment or population modeling uh, information. So I think that's there now for at least some stocks and um, the opportunity to develop more is, uh, is on its way. There's also a tremendous amount of work going into looking at shifts in species distributions of ground fish uh, with data from uh, the trawl survey, as well as from commercial data. Uh, so starting to get at issues of when uh, environmental conditions like bottom temperature and dissolved oxygen um, are uh, causing some stocks to move around a lot uh, and some uh, choosing to try to ride it out. Uh, and that puts them in closer or more remote proximity to different port groups. Um, so it could have uh, some considerations around things like allocation, availability to different ports, transboundary fisheries, and so forth. So I think we're getting there. Um, it would be useful for us to talk more about the best with the council about the best way of presenting information like that, because our report that we presented today and in the briefing book tends to be kind of a step back and pan out look at the ecosystem rather than digging too deeply into individual species. You know, we make exceptions all the time for that, but um, with the groundfish portfolio being as diverse as it is, we'd have to, uh, you know, probably be, you know, careful about thinking about how to, uh, how to, how to pull that off in a way um, that is digestible for um, the right audiences. But I hope that answers your question. Uh, and it looks like Greg uh, Kritzikowski has, I hope I got that right, Greg. I hope, uh, I very hope, much hope so. Um, thanks for the great answer to Michelle's question. In terms of input on how to best shape the CCIA for future use, it would be useful to hear from stock assessors um, for all council FMP management unit species uh, can be utilized for assessment management purposes. Uh, agree, and I have to imagine that that's part of the content of at least one of the initiatives in the forthcoming FEP uh, appendix. Um, let's see, next question is- Before, from, uh, yeah, before you go to Dan, just one Please. second. Um, Merritt McRae, if you're still on, thank you very much for that link. I'll take a look at it. Hopefully it'll get us some good fire maps, but thank you for that link. Okay, sorry, Chris. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Toby. Um, Dan Holland asks, can you comment on the hypoxia indicator and the ecological implications of having longer or larger hypoxic areas? Toby, would you like to take the first cut at that? Yeah, well, I mean, first of all, if we have longer and larger hypoxic areas, it means there's a change in the upwelling. So, um, and very likely that means it's an increase in the upwelling, which has some very positive elements to it. But what it means is for benthic communities on the shelf and slope, they're going to be uh, much more stressed. And whether they, uh, if they remain, you get to probably more die-offs. If they're able to move, then you've got some species distribution changes. And then I can take a, at least a crack at the ecological implications. Um, uh, this is, um, I think an area of some uh, uncertainty, partly because I, my perception, Dan, is that the scale at which uh, our, and, and the, the way our sampling of ground fish is done with uh, the uh, bottom trawl surveys that make the uh, twice annual passes from north to south down the, the uh, shelf and upper slope um, is that, um, those surveys are, in some ways, they're intended uh, mainly to support the kinds of science that underpin assessments. And they're not surgically designed enough to be able to track, um, you know, short-term discrete movements of fish from condition X to condition Y. And um, 
and that means um, you know we need just lots of data uh, with contrasting conditions to start to really get a picture of you know really really drilling in on what it means and that's what's going into a lot of the species distribution modeling of groundfish that's going on right now. Uh, the ecological implications, um, it really, I guess it probably depends on which kinds of stocks you're talking about. Um, for less mobile species uh, that maybe aren't as good at swimming up and away from uh, from conditions or are slower moving, and I'm thinking, you know, something maybe like a Dungeness crab here, um, they definitely are at risk of of essentially being suffocated. And I think there was pretty good evidence that that did occur in 2021, uh, where some uh, crab pots were coming up with lots of, uh, lots of dead crabs in them. And there were also some uh, reports from commercial crab fishermen uh, of crab washups on beaches. Um, and so these were probably not molts, these were the real deal. For, um, for ground fish, uh, I'm less aware of of fish kills, although there definitely have been fish kills in extreme um, West Coast hypoxic events in the past. I think back in the mid aughts, there were some. Um, and uh, so the, the range of ecological implications could be ones of fish simply moving to more hospitable conditions, um, uh, which could potentially lead to some being, you know, more dispersed or more packed in, depending on what their ecology is, their behavior is. Uh, and uh, potentially sublethal effects uh, on things like uh, growth rates. Uh, but I think we're still in the um, figure it out phase for a lot of this. Uh, Northwest Center scientists have done a, a good amount of work to determine which species seem to respond more vigorously to um, dissolved oxygen depletion than others and which ones seem to be uh, more tolerant as well. And there are some species, especially lower shelf and uh, upper slope species that are commercially valuable that also can handle hypoxia pretty well. So I think the answer is that's a that's my typically long-winded way of saying it depends. Uh, Deb Wilson Vandenberg, congratulations on ten years of reports. Thank you very much. It, um, we we feel all ten years of them. Uh, that is a milestone. Um, like the addition of Alpcore diets, did we consider breaking this up geographically to concur with the geographic? Uh, breakdowns representing Ford species. Um, that's a terrific question. Uh, I'm minimally qualified to answer it. Um, I can tell you, uh, Deb, that the sample size, because these are fishery dependent data, um, and um, I don't know how that program works and how um, you know how what there's what their protocols for sampling are. Sample sizes, at least for 2021, were pretty low for Albacore, and they're probably still being processed as well. Uh, because uh, with COVID, there have been some delays in uh, access to labs for NOAA scientists and NOAA uh, affiliates to, to do a lot of that processing. So I don't know how much we're going to be able to say geographically yet, uh, compounded by the fact that <laughs> Albacore and other HMS by de definition move around a lot. So uh, I, I really don't know how much and how I'm, I'd have to lean on my partners to say how much you could uh, connect a fish caught at coordinates A, B, and C to have fed at those coordinates, or if uh, you know fed somewhere else and then swum there and gotten caught. Uh, it's a it's a great and uh, and nuanced question. And that was a clumsy uh, dodge of a great question. So uh, looks like Corey has a, Corey Niles has another question. Yeah, and if others want to go, please kit, put, may, let, let them go first before me. Um, the, on the hypoxia one, you've triggered another question. Uh, maybe this one's for Toby again, but Toby, you painted the picture of um, hypoxic waters kind of like moving north um, from Oregon into Washington. Is that this, the dumb question? Is is that the water actually moving north or is that just the processes that causing the hypoxia happening off Washington, but, but later later in time, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think it's the latter. I think okay. um, you're seeing that uh, the um, upwelling might be a little bit stronger to the south, and so you're bringing that open ocean water up a little bit deeper a little bit sooner. But as the season goes on, I think what it, it has to do with the upwelling and the water that's being supplied up on the shelf. I do not think 
you know, the California undercurrent moves northward, but it generally is not that hypoxic. So I think it's more related to the upwelling than it is the circulation of water moving north. Yeah, don't worry. I have one more, sorry. So just thinking about uh, like the topic of, of using indicators and in, in decision-making more, and this is one we ask you probably every year too, the salmon stoplight ones, and, and you have more of them now than we did when you started. And yeah, 10 years, wow, congratulations. Um, but I guess the thing that always, you know, catches a lot of our eyes is, you know, if uh, yellow and green, you know, d does it, do we use three colors because that's the best we can do in ranking some of these things? Uh, or, you know, why don't you use a smoother grade? Like, like you could have, if you're using thirds, a yellow and green can be really close to each other. And sorry, people are arriving home here if you're hearing some background noises. Um, but can you, do you just do use yellow, red, and green because that's the best that can be done with the data? Or is it, is it more of a communication tool to um, keep it simple? And again, question we probably asked you at least nine times out of the 10 years. Uh, it's, it's definitely, I think, um, it's a, it's right now, I would say it's a communication tool as much as anything, um, you know, because we have, it's convenient to call them stoplight charts and, uh, red, yellow, green, and, and all that. Um, and we have actually, uh, in the, the small one that we, uh, include for Central Valley Fall Chinook, um, there is more nuance in that one, um, and the debates over whether something should be orange or red are probably just as uh, engaged and passionate as uh, as uh, green versus yellow or yellow versus red. So, um, and uh, we uh, and we would anticipate that we are going to. Uh, the SSC has been asking us, I think, quite reasonably um, for several years now to uh, really set aside the time to uh, give those um, those considerations more of a, qual a quantitative treatment and objective treatment um, so that they're less uh, artistic, let's say, and more uh, defendable and, uh, and, and uh, repeatable. Uh, so, um, that's really the way I would characterize it in a nutshell. Um, and I think it's important to have those conversations because, uh, you know, the this is one of those things about, you know, 10 years into the report, there's one thing that we can be sure of is that uh, we're always going to be asked if there are ways that we could make their report better next year. And um, for some audiences, red, green, yellow is, uh, is better. For some audiences, um, five or six colors is better. So, uh, so it's a it's kind of a bit of a push pull, but um, but it certainly is it's 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 essential conversations to have so that we know that we're conveying the right point accurately to the uh, set of ears that's listening. I think I saw some other. Are there other hands up right now? Uh, I got two. There are no other hands. There was, a, let's see, an additional chat uh, that, from Kim Jacobson. I'm not sure if it's a question, uh, but open to opinions for improving communication in, regard, in relation to the stoplight chart. And, and Kim is the point person um, for that program. So if, if anyone's going to, you know, <laughs> be uh you know the right person to convey feedback to it's kim um so I the comment up about yeah. that is Sorry. probably for you chris yeah yeah um michelle, michelle. michelle robinson asks what is the quality and quantity and quality of human dimensions data for participants in council managed fisheries could information be provided to better inform council decisions that support improved access and equity Mm. Um, I think we could throw that one at Kip. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I guess um, there. I don't think there are any indicators that are explicit in that regard. Perhaps some of those in the the. I'm come thinking about the tile index that you know is sort of an issue at a gross scale of 
uh, around distributional issues. And there might be, you know, extensions on that um, in terms of looking at uh, distribution of revenues. Um, obviously, there's the other side of the coin in terms of, you know, what is the sort of um, social demographic characteristics of different populations that are engaged in fishing. Um, maybe there's a way to mush that together in some kind of indicator, but well beyond my expertise. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say that we we do include some. Uh, I didn't feature them as much as perhaps I might have um, in our section uh, on uh, indicators of certainly of um, let's say the social safety nets, if you will, of different communities from the, um, the community vulnerability indexes that um, are estimated for all coastal communities, uh, and um, and so that's that's a start. Uh, we we also have um, different kinds of survey instruments that uh, Dan Holland, who's on the call, uh, and colleagues of his uh, have, and um, and other um, other uh, participant survey tools that have been used, say, uh, in response to um, the effects of harmful algal blooms uh, that led to fishery closures. Um, that can get down in, into different levels of participants within a community. Um, those are labor intensive and they tend to focus on, um, in, some of those anyway are labor intensive and tend to focus on smaller numbers of community rather, rather than being say a, a coastwide swath. And there's inevitably going to be some uh, levels of participation that are harder to reach than others as I think everybody uh, would, would acknowledge. Um, so, I don't. I don't feel qualified to comment on the quantity and quality, um, and and how um, how well it would translate to indicators the way that we present them, um, which is the you know time series and things like that. That that might be aspirational at this point, um, but it's unquestionably a an, an objective and um, a, a red flashing light for us. Uh, I. Um, hope that we are going to be able to make progress on that and uh, that some of our future reports can include some feedback from those kinds of participant surveys that Dan Holland is doing. They just probably won't be in the form of time series and we'll have to be thoughtful about how we present it and contextualize it. Uh, Louis Zim's hand is up. Thank you, Chris. That's, that was a very difficult question that was just asked you. Uh, we're on the uh, Fish and Game Commission level. We're, we're working on doing a, a coastal communities and involvement of other of communities that have not been involved previously in trying to get them in or, or actually to, uh, to, to spotlight their, their increasing uh, involvement in our, in our fisheries, which is a good thing. But I'm going to ask you a, a question that's uh, – probably much along your line, uh, pyrosomes. I, I was looking at your list of things uh, that increased or decreased in, in the uh, present trends, uh, and I didn't see pyrosomes. I saw things like egg yolk, thingamajiggies, and such like that. In San Diego, we have a huge pyrosome community out here uh, in our offshore waters, which is impacting our fishing. And I know up in Oregon previously uh, that there was so much pyrosome around that they, they couldn't trawl nets. We did a, um, a trawl, a small mesh trawl, midwater trawl out here uh, at SIO on the Robert Gordon Sprawl, and it came up just choked with pyrosomes. Do you, do you have any input on that? Yeah, thanks, Louis. Uh, from what you're saying, that sounds very consistent with what um, what we do know from uh, from the survey work that we have. We I correct, I did not uh, present it, um, and I don't even know if we have a plot of them in the uh, in the report. Um, that's that was mainly just kind of I think a decision on our part because the last time that we were able to present pyrosome data, you know, would have been from 2019 prior to the the, all the interruptions that happened from COVID uh, in sampling in 2020. And the 2019 report, we had these lovely maps that someone uh, developed. I, I'm, I, I'm 
awful. I forget who uh, who that was, but uh, those maps were terrific maps of distribution of pyrosomes from uh, from border to border. Uh, the 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 gestalt I get from uh, folks who the eyes on the water from last year is that pyrosomes kind of made a brief cameo in uh, not terribly big numbers, uh, say in waters in central and southern Oregon, uh, that their numbers picked up uh, to average to above average by the time you're in Monterey Bay. And then as you got further south in California, their numbers picked up uh, quite a bit. Um, and we we definitely want to continue to keep track of them uh, for and, and, you know, keep get a sense of both their ecological role since they seem to be sticking around, even though, um, you know, it was a cool year that we still saw them. Um, so these these stick around species like that, that we thought were warm water species and then they're hanging on. Um, might represent some of just the, the, the new dynamics in some communities. Uh, and certainly they represent, like you say, uh, you know, great nuisances to, to fishing practices. I think in the, in the years to come, the survey work that we represent for Central California for the forage um, data, those are, those are data that the Southwest Center has been collecting since the 80s. Um, we present data from that core area, and that sampling gear is pretty good at sampling pyrosomes. We have one picture of deck biologists with baskets full of them from last year. Um, that survey now has a couple of decades worth of data much further north and much further south, and that's a long enough time series that we feel like we could start representing forage data from more areas better with that particular sampling approach. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, not only just improve our overall forage reporting uh, in, in more consistent ways in the future, but also we can draw a better highlight on um, particular species of importance uh, or concern like pyrosomes. But uh, Louis, it sounds like your reading of it is very consistent with what uh, NIMS biologists have seen. Well, so Louis, I'd, yes. I'd just add to Louis, there's a comment on page nine about the pyrosomes and pretty much says what what Chris just said, high in the south, decreasing north, uh, north of Cape Mendocino. They were still seen off of Newport, but I mean, off of Trinidad Head, but not much more. And also um, H2, uh, Appendix H2 does have a time series of pyrosomes um, for the core area, uh, central core area, which do show that they were above a standard deviation, above average. Thank you, Toby. And, and this is a perfect example of the utility of your report. Um, midwater fishermen, et cetera, need to know that, uh, that areas of high pyrosome abundance are going to be difficult areas uh, to fish with smaller mesh nets and also in our uh, oceanographic research. Um, I, I can remember when we had a huge amount of uh, pluricodes and uh, it completely kept us away from doing our research. And so it helps us in, in planning research and it also in, in planning our fisheries uh, on, a, on a short term. So it's very helpful. Thank you. I'm going to I'm just throwing a little plug for um, for uh, collaboration between um, the fishing sector and the science sector. Uh, following what Louis just said, um, I I don't know how how prevalent this is, but I could imagine some concerns in NOAA surveys with uh, gear getting clogged by pyrosomes or other gelatinous zooplankton uh, leading to some stations being avoided because uh, the data quality that would come from, um, for, uh, you know, let's say forage species, quote unquote, would be, would be biased and compromised by, uh, by lots and lots of pyrosomes getting into the net and affecting uh, net efficiency. Um, so uh, observations that would come from industry of where pyrosomes are um, could really be useful in um, both fishery and non-fishery data contributing to uh, understanding of where pyrosomes are likely to show up. Louis, that's super valuable feedback of, uh, of an application of, of ecosystem data 
in a in a realm that I don't know if I normally would have necessarily uh, thought of. So really appreciate that. Okay, well, I don't want to cut off a uh, discussion or further questions. Um, we are approaching our advertised end of, of this session. Uh, so mindful of people's time and so on, I guess I recommend we wrap up. Uh, I guess, um, I don't know, maybe make a, a I'll do a last call uh, for, for any, any other questions or comments, and then, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, well, uh, I, I, uh, I wanna thank uh, Drs. Harvey and Garfield for this presentation. I always find the annual report really interesting, thought-provoking, and I find their presentation a, a great, synopsis and a and a way to really better understand kind of the key messages that are coming out of the the indicators and data um, so uh, yeah I, I I appreciate this uh, this opportunity and uh, as probably a lot of you know and I previously mentioned this will be coming to the council the council meeting starts next week uh, and uh, Perhaps some of the advisory bodies will be wanting to uh, discuss this further, consider submitting comments uh, to the council on the annual report. And as I mentioned, this is uh, scheduled on the council's meeting agenda for Sunday after next. Um, and so you'll, if you participate then, you'll hear another possibly, although I think this is an excellent presentation. I know that, um, at the beginning, Toby framed it as off, off Broadway. So maybe they think they'll have an even more polished uh, presentation in the in another ten days. But uh, I think it was it was excellent as it is. But uh, certainly, if you want to uh, listen again and hear uh, any discussion the council has, uh, there is that opportunity. Um, in the, it, it, in the can, can I take? Could I take just one opportunity to um, certainly to thank everybody who contributed discussion and questions, but also Toby and I stand on the shoulders of just dozens and dozens of field scientists uh, and lab scientists and um, modelers and co-authors and contributors and careful editors. Uh, and we get the we get to be the lucky public facing uh, pair that that presents this, but um, the 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 tens of thousands of hours of, of good work that underlies this by, you know, so many people from NOAA and from partner agencies and institutions is cannot be overstated how, how good that group of people is and how uh, excellent their work is and we're in their debt. Okay. Well, uh, with that, um, I think we can end this session. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, this I have recorded this. Uh, obviously, the folks have stuck stuck it out throughout. You've heard it, but if somebody approaches you and says, "Dang, I I missed it," or, or whatever, um, you can let them know. We we will be making the recording available. Um, I'll figure out somewhere to post it up on the council website in the next 24 hours or so. So anyways, with that, um, I'll let uh, wrap this up and people can go on their way. Thanks, everybody, for participating and all of your input and questions.